Professor Kristen Henning will introduce our honorary degree recipient, Sherilyn Eiffel. Sherilyn Eiffel once said, what it means to be a civil rights lawyer is to be very clear-headed about the weaknesses in American democracy, to be clear-headed about fundamental inequality and about racial inequality, but also to believe that there is a role for you to play and for the law to play in transforming the inequality in our country. Ms. Eiffel has assumed her role as a civil rights leader with grace and distinction for the last 35 years. Today, Georgetown honors a transcendent thinker, an intersectional scholar, an activist, and a leader who has dedicated her professional life to historical truth-telling in the pursuit of justice, to challenging the narratives that have inflicted trauma on marginalized people within our country and to an unwavering commitment to justice and equity at the intersection of race, gender, poverty, education, and economic opportunities. Ms. Eiffel embarked upon her legal career in the 1980s during a time of social, political, and legal uncertainty when the progress of the 1960s civil rights era appeared to be unraveling both in Congress and in the courts across our nation. As a young advocate, Ms. Eiffel often watched documentaries and read stories about the triumphs of the civil rights movement and wished that she too had been a part of these transformative times. But inspired and undaunted, she recognized the present era as her moment, her opportunity to shape the destiny of our community. Immediately, graduate, immediately after graduating from law school in 1987, Ms. Eiffel served as in a year-long fellowship in the American Civil Liberties Union, followed by five years at the NAACP Legal uh, Defense and Education Fund, where she worked on important voting rights litigation highlighted by the landmark Supreme Court case Houston Lawyers Association versus the Attorney General of Texas, holding that trial judges' elections are also covered by the Voting Rights Act. In 1993, Ms. Eiffel joined the faculty of the University of Maryland Carey School of Law, where she became a prolific writer and a leading voice in racial justice. Teaching gave her an opportunity to share what she had learned from her clients at the ACLU and LDF and led her to launch a full service civil rights clinic with her students representing low income and minority clients in the Baltimore area. After two decades of educating law students just like you, whom she saw as the nation's next generation of civil rights lawyers, Ms. Eiffel became the seventh president of the Legal Defense and Education Fund. During her tenure, LDF experienced a period of tremendous visibility, largely due to the organization's increased focus and leadership on voter suppression in the wake of Shelby County versus Holder and against inequity in education, economic disparities, and racial discrimination in the criminal legal system. Her achievements are even more impressive as we evaluate her leadership within an ever divided nation. And in the face of numerous racial tragedies during her tenure, including the tragic losses of Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Ms. Eiffel's successor at LDF, Janine Nelson, reflected on her predecessor's 
unrelenting tenacity to never be so challenged by the difficult times that we're facing that we cannot find a pathway or a through line to the other side. As Ms. Nelson said, Sherilyn Eiffel is quite strategic about thinking of ways to turn even the most dire circumstances into a learning lesson, a teachable moment at a minimum. And often leveraging the, the, the tragedies as a point of change and radical transformation. What a powerful lesson for our university community and for our law graduates. In recognition of her myriad achievements and unshakable commitment to equity, Georgetown University is privileged to bestow upon Sherilyn Eiffel the degree, the honorary degree of Doctors of Law. Thank you. Beautiful, Chris. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Congress of the United States and by the Board of Directors of Georgetown University, I officially confer upon Sherilyn Eiffel the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. It is my profound honor to introduce Sherilyn Eiffel, who will now address the graduating class. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dean Trainer and President DeJoya and the faculty and staff, and of course, all of you in the class of 2022 and your families and friends who joined us here today. I'm so excited for you, congratulations. It's hot, um, but I'm not taking this off. And um, I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. I wanna first salute you, the class of 2022, for just having made it and being here today. These three years I know have not been easy. They have been tough years in our world, in our country, and at Georgetown Law. You've endured a law school journey that no lawyer alive who came before you can match. You completed law school in the midst of a global pandemic. You learned remotely, initially from teachers and with students you'd never met. You endured the strange return to in-person learning. You dealt with Delta and Omicron and wherever, whatever we're calling the latest variant. Many of you in this audience today have had your lives touched by COVID infection. Some of you have lost loved ones. All of us have lost a million of our fellow Americans. And none of us have had sufficient time or opportunity to fully absorb the meaning of this catastrophic loss or to properly grieve it. You have seen our planet driven to the brink of climate disaster. You've seen our democracy driven to the cliff's edge, where we remain precariously perched. You watched the video of the torture and murder of George Floyd. You've seen our politics degraded. You watched in horror as our capital was attacked in an effort to overturn the election. You saw members of con Congress fleeing for their lives. You saw something that has never been seen before in our history, a Confederate flag paraded through the halls of the Capitol. You've read something. No law students before you have read prior to this year, a fully formed leaked draft of a Supreme Court opinion that would strike down a right deemed fundamental for 50 years. And you endured controversy here at Georgetown, hurtful and disparaging words uttered by professors, words that demeaned and inflamed and poured salt in the open wound of racism and caused you to have to think about your own environment and atmosphere here at the law school. But you also participated in the most consequential election of our lifetimes and you did it in the midst of that global pandemic. 
you contributed to the highest participation in a presidential election that this country has ever seen. You perhaps took to the streets along with millions of others in all 50 states and around the world to express your outrage, to stand against racism and police violence, and to state your commitment to justice and equality. You returned to your homes, many of you, and reignited your warm and close relationships with your parents and your siblings during the lockdown. You witnessed and cheered on the confirmation of the first black woman to a seat on the United States Supreme Court. A fully... A fully, uniquely, and supremely qualified woman who will be sworn into her seat in a few weeks. And you still mastered contracts and personal jurisdiction and race judicata. You still wrote brilliant student notes. You still filed and litigated truly impressive cases, wrote briefs and drafted legislation in your terrific clinics. So I want to salute you. I want to recognize that you've had to do the most important thing you can do in difficult times, persevere. It's not a small thing and it deserves acknowledgement. Now I know you're smart and talented, but your perseverance is what has brought you here to this day. The great American writer James Baldwin famously said, beyond talent lie all the usual words, discipline, love, luck, but most of all, endurance. And you have endured. Please give yourself a round of applause. I want to say a word about your faculty because um, the unpleasantness created by unhelpful and even offensive words of a few faculty members appropriately received your attention. But I want to reassure everyone here, especially the parents, as you and I'm sure um, everyone knows, in the main, your faculty is superb and they endured as well. It was not easy for them either. Your hardworking faculty had to learn to Zoom teach. They led important discussions on campus during incredibly volatile periods. And so many of them were critical to helping guide so many of us around the country in our thinking about events that were unfolding around us. Many of us who were engaged in intense civil rights litigation and legislative efforts full time relied on the scholarship and the interventions and the engagement of Georgetown law faculty members to help us as we did our work and I want to acknowledge them for their excellence. Anyone who seeks to join this faculty should know that it is a privilege to be a part of this faculty and to teach Georgetown Law students. So students, I'm gonna need you to take a deep breath. I know it's hot, but take one anyway. Because despite your endurance, more of you is required. More of all of us. Because as I said, our democracy remains precariously perched at the cliff's edge and there's much work to be done if we're to find a pathway to a stronger, more enduring democracy. I'm not singling you out for this work. If I were speaking to a class of graduates from journalism school or an MBA program or a public policy school or seminary, I would charge them similarly. Because if our democracy is to be saved, let alone strengthened, it will require the committed participation of every aspect of civil society. Each institution, whether business, journalism, law, or our faith institutions, will have to find the courage to confront its own weaknesses, to examine its role in contributing to the unraveling of our democracy, and will have to reimagine its own obligations and role in protecting and strengthening American democracy going forward. But lawyers and the legal profession play a particular and uniquely important role in the health of a democracy. Lawyers are charged with articulating, protecting, and upholding the rule of law, and we can only do that with integrity and power when we can satisfy our own hearts and minds that the legal system within which we work and to which we have pledged an oath is in fact just and fair. And so to fulfill our professional obligation to uphold the rule of law, Lawyers must, in, in my view, also work to create a truly just justice system. This is a big lift. And at times, even to me, it seems insurmountable. But the alternative is what we see, the ever accelerating downward spiral of our democracy. Here's the good news. 
you and I, we, are heirs of a band of lawyers, men and women, who were regarded by this country as second-class citizens, but who nevertheless set about to change the course of American democracy. Just a few names, Thurgood Marshall, Pauli Murray, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Jack Greenberg, Constance Baker Motley, Robert Carter, and so many others. And millions of men and women, including myself, around the world were inspired to become lawyers because of them. What we must remember is that when they did their most consequential work, they had no blueprint. They had no country upon which they modeled their vision. Most had never known a life without Jim Crow. For most of them, none in their family had known a life without Jim Crow segregation or slavery itself. They had not lived in a world without gender discrimination. But out of their own imagination, their own dedication, their own commitment to justice and equality, they created a plan to end legal apartheid in America and to make women first-class citizens. And they executed that plan. And their work allowed many of us to be sitting where we are today, living where we live, married to who we're married to, traveling later to eat in a restaurant of our choosing, checking out of a hotel where we wouldn't have been allowed to stay, or preparing for jobs that would never have even considered us 70 years ago. I say this often because we are facing a time when perhaps you are, and if I'm honest, sometimes I am unsure about whether we can create the kind of democracy that truly ensures equal protection, that respects the dignity of immigrants, that protects a woman's right to determine what happens with her own body, that protects the rights and dignity of gay, lesbian, queer, and transgender Americans, that ensures full voting access for all eligible citizens, that has a robust and dynamic political system that ensures that all voices are heard, and that embraces economic policies that benefit folks both at the bottom and the top. Maybe you fear that we cannot stop climate degradation. Perhaps this week, after the massacre in Buffalo, you fear that we can never end America's embrace of white supremacy and its violence. Perhaps you fear that we cannot end hate crimes against Asian Americans or anti-Semitic violence. Maybe you see the rise of authoritarianism not only in this country but around the world and you fear that things are getting worse. You see footage from Syria and Yemen and from the Ukraine and you fear that we've learned nothing about the wages of war and the importance of peace. Maybe you see the work of those storied, lawyer, storied lawyers I mentioned being dismantled and you were uncertain about how to make a difference. I understand. You may be uncertain. But I want you to know that as lawyers, they were uncertain too. Those monumental lawyers of whom I speak, they had never seen what they were fighting for. Often their own people believed it was a pipe dream. They worked in cramped offices for little pay. They endured the indignity of unfair treatment in the courtroom. We celebrate their wins, but they lost a string of cases and had to keep going. Often they just weren't sure if their strategy was working. But their courage made the lives of most of us assembled today possible. We don't need to be sure. We just need to be determined and imaginative and dedicated and relentless. And that graduating class of 2022, I know you are. Because you persevered, persevered these past three years, I know that you have been trained to keep pushing, to overcome setbacks, to move forward no matter what. That is the spirit we will need from you in the coming years. Now, much as I'd like to, I'm not trying to sign you all up to be civil rights lawyers 24-7. I'm suggesting that in whatever area of law you practice, your first obligation as a citizen, as a lawyer, is to our democracy. And we must influence our profession to reimagine re an explicit embrace of this obligation as well. Because this is where I fear our profession may have begun to lose its way. And we've seen this over the last seven years. There have been bright lights, to be sure, I've been excessively proud of the work of civil rights lawyers. But we've also seen the distressing excesses of some in our profession, those who have forgotten that we are officers of the court and what that means. That means that no matter how zealous we are as advocates, we cannot mislead the court. We must not file frivolous claims. 
We must not trample the rights of those who protest or who are incarcerated or who are immigrants. That when we are government lawyers, our professional standards must be even higher. That it matters when we make representations under penalty of perjury or just before the public, which must be able to count on our word. And when we are judges, the standards must be higher still. It was 68 years ago that the Supreme Court said that justice must satisfy the appearance of justice. What does that mean? It means that judges must not only be fair and impartial, they must also appear to the public to be fair and impartial. The very legitimacy of the judiciary, which, which rests on the confidence of the public, depends on it. So you, we have our work cut out for us. Your role in whatever area you choose to practice law must be to uphold those standards that make this a profession. To walk in the tradition of lawyers who have advanced the highest democratic ideals. To take seriously ethics and norms that hold us together across political, racial, regional, and gender differences. I am calling on you to recognize the fundamental role our profession plays in upholding a democracy and to embrace it. To recognize and understand how the unraveling of the rule of law guarantees the unraveling of a democracy. What do we mean by the rule of law? We mean that the law applies equally to all, the powerful as to the powerless. That we cannot tolerate the aggressive prosecution of street gang members in Baltimore who are alleged to commit obstruction of justice or witness tamper tampering or conspiracy or racketeering but pretend we don't understand how to apply those same charges to others simply because they work as the, at the highest levels of government or in business. The rule of law means... <laughs> the rule of law means that we do not abuse legal power by shielding our friends from the legal consequences to which we would expose our enemies. The rule of law means that the law is not to be used as a cudgel to control the powerless or as a tool to further lift and enrich the powerful. It means that we can see and understand why judges rule the way they do and that procedure really functions, as Robert Cover once said, as the blindfold of justice. In practical terms for you, that will mean sometimes saying no in your work. This will mean being truthful in all of your representations to the court. This will mean providing counsel to your client, not serving as your client's enabler. This will mean setting an atmosphere of integrity around you. This means challenging and speaking against injustice and unfairness, even if you see it in chambers or at the law firm or on social media. This means not allowing yourself to be used by those seeking cover for unjust ends. And yes, it will mean finding a way to use the excellent education you have received here to make a difference that brings us closer to our ideals. For lawyers, it begins with attending to the integrity of our profession. Perhaps you will work as full-time civil rights or social justice lawyers, I hope so. But if not that, then in private practice, as volunteer lawyers, as candidates for public office, as scholars, as legislators, as government lawyers, in whatever capacity, you must never forget your obligation to our democracy and to the integrity of our profession. It is one of the few things that binds us together. In case this sounds like I'm prescribing a life of unrelenting pressure and work, I want to disabuse you of that notion because the pandemic has taught us all lessons about life and time and balance. I have learned from your generation and finally from my own children about self-care. And I'm so grateful that your generation has figured out what many in mine did not, that we must make time for joy, for friends, for love, for sleep, for prayer, for verses and Netflix, for concerts, for sports and walks in the park. Because once we turn this democracy away from the crumbling cliff's edge, we need whole, intelligent, committed, humane, joyful people to reimagine the country and world we want to live in. And you will need all of your humanity and good health, mental and physical, and imagination, as well as your professional skill and intelligence to contribute to this exciting work. Keep your sense of humor. I've been a practicing lawyer for over 30 years. I've seen some of the worst injustice and cruelty. I've worked for the noblest of clients. I've been more exhausted than I could imagine being. I have pulled the dreaded two all-nighter, the double all-nighter. 
I have shed tears, but I have loved what I do, and I've made sure that no matter the pressure to find fun and laughter in it, the sheer hilarious joy of doing what I love and knowing that I am working for good every day has kept me from bitterness, sustained anger, or despair. And working with colleagues who share a vision of the world we seek to create together has always been the secret sauce in my career. So if you can, do what you love. But I'm just crazy enough to believe that all of you want to live in a democracy. I believe that if you have children or want children, you want them to live in a democracy, and that you chose this profession because it is one in which you feel you can work with dignity and integrity and be of consequence. And so we must accept our fate at this time. This is the hand we were dealt. We are called, compelled, to work to save, transform, and reimagine American democracy for the 21st century. We can't be sure of our success, but we can be sure that without our dedication, our perseverance, our commitment to walk in the courage and daring of those lawyers who came before us, we cannot succeed. So please rest in the coming week, savor this accomplishment, eat good food and drink, moderately, <laughs> dance and turn up, study hard and without distraction for the bar, take it, pass it, but then commit yourself to the work that lies before us. Become the best of this profession and by your example and your demand, pull this profession up to a higher standard of which we can all be proud. In 1978, Thurgood Marshall gave a speech at Howard Law School in which he lamented the state of our democracy. He saw the cracks even then. He riffed on the famous observation about this country from Ben Franklin, it's a republic if you can keep it. But Marshall said, it's a democracy if you can keep it. And then he offered some advice. But in order to keep it, he said, you have to keep moving. If you don't, he said, they'll run you over. So let's keep moving, class of 2022. In our dreams, in our expectations, in our ambitions, in our demands for a better country and a stronger democracy. Let's keep moving. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Ms. Eiffel, for that very moving address. You are truly an inspiration to us all, and that's particularly important at this moment in time and as our graduates start their legal careers. So another round of applause for Cheryl Eiffel.